Aloha. Welcome to American Issues Take One. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host. And for today's title, it's Next Move USA, EU, EU to counter Putin's threats. Uh, October is the 60th anniversary of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, the world came very close to an all-out war between the United States and US, USSR, the Soviet Union, uh, that potentially could, was going to involve uh, the use of nuclear weapons. That didn't happen, thank God. Uh, but fast forward to 60 years later, and we have um, the president of, of Russia, who not only is sable rattling, but he seems to be raising the stakes and, the, and implying that limited tactical nuclear weapons may be used in order to preserve Russia's um, sovereignty his misperceived sovereignty, specifically for the four regions in Ukraine that he annexed um, unlawfully, uh, Donetsk, Luhansk, Kyrgyzstan, and Zaporizhia. Those four territories were formally adopted by the Russian government to say they now belong to Russia and they are Russian territory. And should, um, should any moves be to dislodge Russia from those areas, may be met with severe um, limited tactical nukes. So that's where we are today. Uh, Vladimir Putin seems to be putting himself in a corner that he can't extract himself out of, and he seems to be doing it on purpose. So with that, I'd like to introduce my guests. I'd like to introduce our special guest, Chuck Crumpton. Thank you, Chuck, for appearing. And of course, my co-host, Jay Fidel. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Yeah. Chuck, to you on this first question, uh, as I just mentioned in the intro, Vladimir Putin seems to be raising the stakes and putting himself more and more into a corner. Um, at what point do we, does the United States and the European Union stop referring to it as saber rattling and start to realize that maybe he is serious about using limited tact tactical uh, nuclear weapons in Ukraine? It's a great question, Tim. I think one of the things is because there's so much in the way of political dimensions to this and political powers in there, you can't just treat the EU as one entity. You've got Hungary, Turkey, now Italy, uh, even England with some questions about its choices and directions that didn't used to be there. So first thing I think the EU and the US have to concentrate on three things. One, stay united. Number two, stay committed for the long term. Number three, be consistent internally and externally. If they can do that, the message to Putin at least is he knows his enemy is a conglomerate, not divisible. Mm -hmm. Well, don't you think that Putin, um, don't you think Putin has already realized that? Certainly, I don't think he expected the EU to coalesce around with the United States as fast as they did, and, and certainly to the degree of commitment that they put forth and the money. Wasn't that a miscalculation on his part to begin with? Sure, but miscalculations don't necessarily come with corrections based on factual information as we've seen in our former president continuing on now to today. He's as delusional as he always was. There's good cause to believe that Putin is no less delusional or narcissistic than our former president. So whether he sees that unified response, whether he's really going to respond to it in a way that acknowledges it as a reality that requires adjustment on his part, those are two completely different questions. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess my second part B of the question is, what is the best approach now that Putin has basically, uh, he's annexed, you know, again, um, wrongly annexed these four regions, 
what's now the best approach uh, to, to counter Putin's threats? Is it to ignore it and just say it's saber rattling or, or do we now get more aggressive and come in with more, um, more tactics that maybe polarize the two nations? Well, I'll defer to you folks, but two things that are essential. One is have defensive strategies in place and at the ready for even the worst case plan B analysis. And number two, continue to, with the EU, provide extensive committed support for Ukraine's military actions, which are achieving a level of success that not only Putin, but I think most of the rest of the world did not anticipate. All right, yeah, thanks, Chuck. Uh, Jay, to you, basically the same question is, um, you know, at the beginning of part of this war, and, and it continues that the United States is not get, giving Ukraine aggressive uh, offensive military weapons, such as jets and, and, other, and other offensive weapons. We're still trying to supply them with defensive uh, apparatus. So how does the United States and the EU best now respond to Putin's annexation of the four regions in Ukraine, but more importantly, his uh, more definitive threats of tactical weapon, ta tactical nuclear weapons, possibly for use? Yeah, I don't think this is a good time to give Ukraine jets that would further escalate the, the risk. Um, steady as she goes, just as Chuck says. Steady as she goes. Let's not get too excited. You know, this is international terrorism is what it is. It's like the fellow walking in with a, you know, a vest full of bombs and telling you what he wants and you're supposed to react to it. And he may or may not pull, you know, pull the plug and blow himself up. Um, I, think, I think part of this is Putin. I think he's, he's, he's losing it. <clears throat> and uh, he's losing the war. He's losing his own rationality. Um, part of it is, uh, is this whole echo chamber thing where who is he really talking to? Uh, he, he's not talking to you or me because I wouldn't change my, my approach on it from what he says. I don't believe him. Um, I think he's just stamping his feet like some seven-year-old with a tantrum. Uh, <clears throat> but um, he, is, he is appealing to countries and autocrats that support him anyway, or maybe that are going in that direction, as you mentioned in your opening. Uh, and as Chuck mentioned, you, you know, you have, um, you have countries that are softer on him these days. And uh, maybe he's playing to them. Maybe he's trying to move the needle with them so that they can, uh, you know, be, 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 they can speak up in his favor somehow or, or talk to their populations, their electorates, assuming they still have electorates, um, and, and uh, you know, try to move, move, move right in their countries, move toward Putin. Um, is he talking to the world? Is he talking to all of us? Uh, it's really interesting. You know, who is he talking to? Yeah. I, I love the reference to John F. Kennedy and uh, you know the Cuban Missile Crisis because he didn't back down, um, and he won, not backing down against the Russians. Um, so I, backing down doesn't seem to me a good option because it, you know it's like um, we don't we don't pay. A ransom money as a matter of policy. This is ransom. Um, we, you know, if we do, then it'll happen again. And I guess he had some effect the first time he mentioned nuclear weapons, because uh, now he's trying it again. Uh, and if we if we give him credence on this, I mean, I don't know which part of the echo chamber. If some part of the echo chamber gives him credence on this, he'll do it again, and and that'll be his uh, foreign policy. I well, threaten well, you. You well, bend over. I threaten some more. Yeah, let uh, me interject a logical something. Thing. Let, let me interject this. I mean, we already know that Vladimir Putin has lost face, severe face with the retreat of his armies and this disaster he calls the Ukraine invasion, or he doesn't call that, but that's what it is. Um, has he now set the stage for him for further embarrassment and loss of face by declaring an annexation of the four regions in Ukraine? And it'll be summarily ignored by the weapons that the EU and the USA and everyone gives Ukraine to continue their advances in those four regions. Has he now basically um, raised the stakes enough that he will lose even more face in front of his generals, politicians, 
and to the Russian people? Um, I think you have to watch the, as Chuck suggested, the playbook for Donald Trump and compare it against the playbook for, for Putin. Um, and, I, and I think it has something to do with doubling down here. It has something to do with, and this is the big word, distraction, changing the subject. You know, I mean, I, I, I keep telling you I grew up in Queens and I know the bullies from the schools. And one of the issues, aside from insulting everybody, um, was um, you change the subject. And in fact, there are a lot of lawyers in New York that pra practice that way. You know, when you're, when you're down and out, when you're losing the case, change the subject in every which way. And I think it's clear that he's losing the war in Donbass, and that's why he had the referendum. Um, you know, and the, and the world was maybe distracted by the referendum. And now he's, you know, the referendum has been called out as a sham. So he wants to change the subject yet again. So let's bring back the nuclear card. They make they should make a, a board game, you know, like Monopoly, with all these things that keep repeating themselves. The distraction card, the nuclear card, uh, you know, the phony referendum card. Uh, it's a good, it'll be a very popular board game. It won't sell in Russia, though, I'm telling you now. Um, in any event, um, I think that's what he's doing. And I don't think he's looking to consequences that we would look to, because before you get to those consequences, There'll be more distraction. There'll be more doubling down. There'll be more lying. And Russians are leaving the country by hundreds of thousands. Um, he's got to change the subject or it will be so stark uh, how he is losing. He's really desperate. Look at every direction. Well, and he's that's desperate. the point. I mean, he is desperate. And doesn't that get, ought to give us pause and concern that a desperate uh, despot uh, has the ability to deploy nu tactical nuclear weapons in Ukraine. Well, there are two things that, that, that have got to be on his mission list. You know, one is to expand the USSR um, or back to the USSR. That's, that's not working, but that's what he wants to do. And the question is whether any of this helps, helps him do that. I doubt it does. The other is the personal agenda, you know, to save his job, um, to save his you know, reputation, what have you. And, and blowing up nuclear weapons is not going to do that. That's the answer. Okay. It's not, not going to help him at all. In fact, it's going to, you know, at the end, you, you said, Chuck, that we should be ready with our own counteroffensive. Um, we are. I guarantee you that. You know, I, I could not be more affirmative in guaranteeing you that. Um, so that if he does this, uh, we're going to be escalating. The U.S. is going to be escalating maybe some of the stronger countries in, in NATO will be escalating. Um, and, and Putin can't win that. He loses, he is a super pariah, even with the Chinese and the Indians and, and uh, some of the countries in sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America. All the despots are going to leave his side. They can't possibly support him on that. Um, so he, he destroys himself. He knows this. He's not stupid. He may be illusional. What did you call it, Chuck? But, <laughs> but he's not stupid. Yeah, that's that's a fact. He is not stupid. Uh, Chuck, you know, through all the sanctions, uh, they've had limited success against Russia. But it seems to me that the the call up of 300,000 potential new uh, recruits has struck more of a discord of um, disharmony, if you will, with the Russian people than ever any of the sanctions have um, as far as creating a, a concern of the Russian people. What new tactics should the United States deploy other than the same old sanctions against its individuals or their banking accounts or, or their ability to conduct a swift account transfer? What, what more effective, devastating sanctions can the United States and the EU come up with that will really put Vladimir Putin back on his heels? Well, when you look at Putin's so-called mobilization, at least up to this point in time, it appears that more people have left Russia to avoid it than who have been recruited into it. And you see the <laughs> photography of those who are recruited into it. And there are bowling leagues with people in much better shape than that. 
So, and they know that they're being sacrificed. So this is high risk, but you have to remember there are three strategies involved here. The initial strategy, the blitzkrieg, which wasn't a blitzkrieg and, and wasn't effective. It was slow plotting and unsuccessful. And in the end, essentially reversed. Now, strategy number two, which is I've got four areas that we're going to take. <laughs> he gained probably a lot of confidence with the successful annexation of Crimea years ago and thought he could pull that again, maybe on Ukraine as a country. Clearly that's not the case. Can he do it with all or any of these four areas? Strategically, everybody knows ultimately there's going to be a bargaining. <clears throat> Putin's digging in for the four areas to the extent he can, or as much of that as he can get. <clears throat> President Zelensky is digging in saying, you don't get any of it. So we've got the lines drawn <clears throat> and that's getting a lot more attention and a lot more infusion of effort from both sides than the mm -hmm. verbal references to possible all weapons okay, well, veil let me, threat at nuclear. Let me go in a different direction on this. You know, we have countries still supporting Russia through purchases of either energy products or other products. Mm -hmm. uh, they're basically propping up the ruble and they're, you know, helping Russia skirt around a lot of these sanctions. Uh, China comes to mind, India comes to mind, uh, South African nations come to mind. Should the United States or the EU start exerting a lot more pressure on those nations than we previously have? Chuck. It, probably not unless and until we need to, because I'm sure that the US intelligence, which is, is one of our stronger concerted efforts and forces has determined the impact on the Russian economy. In addition to that, when you impose a threatened mobilization of people who are clearly unqualified and unwilling for military service at the same time, you've got a double whammy effect going on there. So he may be losing support both economically as well as politically and in terms of popularity and in the population of Russia. So if you look at China, India, even the EU, there are some continuing purchases of Russian fuel products and energy products, but the support for Russia militarily and politically have not come. You don't hear China or India, and certainly not any of the EU nations, saying he's doing the right thing, we support him, we will be there to back him up. None of the things like Biden saying, China, you go after Taiwan, you're going to have to deal with us. We will be there. Okay. So look at what, what's missing from the places where he needs that support. Okay, thank you. Jay, um, I'm gonna kind of stick with the same question uh, with you. And that is, should the United States and EU countries uh, start tamping down the screws on those countries, whether they, <clears throat> whether they broadcast it or not, that are still assisting Russia, um, either lessen the sanctions or completely get around the sanctions? Should we start looking at them and start saying, you're part of the problem. The sanctions are not working as intended because you still and are continuing to support Russia's uh, and their economy through purchases. Uh, what should the United States do about um, in ratcheting up sanctions with those countries, or should they? I think uh, all the factors um, point to the, the larger phenomenon here, and, and that is that he's falling on his own sword. Um, that, and that if we wait a little longer with the combination of the sanctions we have now and his uh, pariah status in the world, the uh, word is going to get out on the war crimes. Uh, it is getting out. You hear more and more about that. And we at Think Tech, we hear more and more about that. 
Um, it's, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's everywhere, the talk of the war crimes. This is not good for him. Um, and people in Russia, leaving Russia, you know, all these things, um, you know, are, are resulting in a loss of uh, status, influence, and so forth uh, in the world community. However, the question is, what else can we do? Because the sanctions uh, are, uh, they're not immediate, they're intermediate. And uh, they may not have the effect that we hoped for, we in Europe hoped for at the inception of this thing. So if we wanted to turn up the jets uh, for one thing, um, we would um, find ways to uh, deliver energy even in the winter, especially in the winter, um, to countries that where, the, where the people are screaming for energy. They're going to get cold and soon, a matter of weeks, a crunch there. Um, and so, um, you know, the problem with liquid natural gas is that we have it, we have gobs of it, um, they don't have receiving infrastructure, say in Germany and the countries around Germany. Um, if we could somehow accelerate that, that would, that would help because you wouldn't have him undermining, you know, national resolve in some of these countries. But the other thing is, uh, and I really take your point about um, about trying to put some influence on the countries that are soft on him. And you can do that in any way you want, you know. You can have somebody from our State Department come talk to somebody from their State Department and say, you know, this is going to be over not too long, um, and the U U.S. is going to be in the catbird on this, and, uh, and Putin's going to be in the, in the doghouse, and who do you want to invest with? You know, you don't want us to be mad at you. Come on. Uh, how about how about a little cocoa here? And, and I think uh, in some countries that would work swell. In other countries, you have to move maybe more aggressively. Uh, in some countries, you know, make a deal, make a deal for energy, make a deal for food, make it transactional. And you could ply them away from Russia. Uh, I think India is a good example of that. India is not wedded to Russia. And, um, you know, India has a soft spot for the United States. It always did, this, despite Modi's uh, um, Modi's attitudes, which I don't favor. Um, and so, you know, I think there are various solutions with various countries and a, a nuanced approach by the State Department uh, could put the heat on. Not all at the same time, not all in the same way, but they could turn the jets tighter, harder, hotter um, for Putin that way. And I think in the long term, if they're not doing that already, so that's exactly what they should do. So is this a wait and see game? Because you, like, like someone said, I think it was you, Jay. He's already falling on his own sword. So is this a wait and see game, or no? We don't have time to wait anymore. Uh, Putin's ratcheting up the the demands and the threats. So now is the time to get these these nations of like India or China or whatever. Now is the time to use that ratchet effect uh, rather than later. This whole thing is asymmetric. It's asymmetric on his part. You know, like, for example, where he does hacking on a given country to soften them up, you know, he's, mm -hmm. he's working on every level he can. He's working on trying to get the, uh, you know, uh, the government here in the United States to go soft on him. We can talk about that tomorrow. Um, but, you know, bottom line is uh, it's asymmetric on his part, and it should certainly be asymmetric on our part. That's the nature of war today. So, yes, I think he's falling on his own sword. Yes, um, you know, the combination of things, including his, his own mistakes, are hurting him, you know, in, in very profound ways. But that doesn't mean we should sit and wait. It means we should try other things in a, in a soft, modulated way, perhaps, in a, a smart power, soft power approach, country by country, a political official by political official. We should always keep on moving, and we should make it just as asymmetric as he is. Okay. There you go. You missed your opportunity to work for the State Department, by the way. I like your tactics. <laughs> Chuck, um, winter is coming in. It's October. Winter is coming soon to Eastern Europe. Uh, do things slow down? And as all winter campaigns kind of basically come to a you know a trickling halt. Uh, with that halt, we probably won't have any more Ukraine um, announcements of achievements and, 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 and captured territory that Russia once held. So lack of really great news because winter's here and everyone's hunkering down. Uh, how's the resolve go? How is the resolve from uh, the United States and the EU uh, during the winter months? Uh, stay the same? 
uh, only increase with more funding or does it wane? It's a great question. I would not <clears throat> underestimate President Zelensky and Ukraine, their momentum and their initiative and their dedication. And think of the Green Bay Packers and the frozen tundra. If they get on that turf at the end of the pro football season, they're really hard to beat. They're going to press that advantage. So you don't think winter um, reasons. at all blunts Ukrainians too. advanced? Sorry? You don't, you don't think necessarily winter, the winter weather will uh, blunt Ukrainians advance into these four regions that uh, Russia now says is theirs? <laughs> The weather certainly has the impact to make a difference, but whether it shifts the momentum away from Ukraine toward Russia or toward a stalemate, I, I wouldn't assume that. Okay. The other thing to remember is that Putin's delusions and miscalculations and poor strategies have probably done more for Joe Biden and the Democrats than they possibly could have, or anyone possibly could have. His foreign policy is essentially so sacrosanct that he's gotten everything he's asked for, for the Ukrainian military support in the billions and billions of dollars. And that appears to continue to be the case. So I wouldn't estimate that, underestimate that either. Will that make a difference in a month? It may or may not. I. I'm not sure why the Democrats are not pressing that foreign policy, foreign strategy advantage that they clearly have, but it's there. Yeah, I mean, it seems like it. it seems on an overall basis, the nation still and does support uh, the support of Ukraine. And that's a good question you bring to the table is why hasn't the Biden administration kind of taken advantage of that popularity? Uh, OK, we're almost out of time. But I have to ask this question, Jay, to you. What are your predictions for the Ukraine conflict, this war that was created by Vladimir Putin for no reason, but other than his own uh, ego and uh, illusions of grandeur? What's your prediction in the next six months, 12 months? You know, a, a few days ago, I can't remember the channel might have been BBC, um, but um, they had Mrs. Zelensky mm -hmm. um, on for an interview. That was actually 60 Minutes. 60 Minutes, yeah. Thank yeah. You. And uh, my goodness, if you saw that, it would make your heart run fast. Um, she was not only an extraordinary, you know, classy, classy woman. She was so smart, so focused. So with her husband. I mean, if you if you gauge a man's um, you know success in the world by how well his wife supports him, this was an example of a wife who supports her husband. It, it, somehow it was easier to understand Zelensky uh, seeing this interview and seeing her comment on things. She was unrestrained. She was completely informed. She was brilliant and she was a great communicator. Um, I, you know, I think she was part of his, his TV team when he, when he, when he was doing it. She was, <laughs> yes. I think she was the writer. <laughs> okay. We're talking about a fantastic woman. Okay. Then fast forward to all of these battlefield commanders. And it's not just one person. It's not just one PR trained, um, you know, spokesman for the Ukrainian army. It's one after the other, over and over, different people, uh, an assortment, um, you know, an, an unending random supply of battlefield commanders talking about, you know, their state of mind and what they see happening and, and how they deal with their own success or maybe their own aspirations. And you say, gee, where do they get these guys? These are really classy guys. They're intelligent. They're informed. They're thoughtful, they're reasonable. And then you talk to the people who we talk to on Think Tech. You talk to the people, for example, with Project Expedite Justice in Kyiv just a few days ago, a fellow named Dimitrov Koval. Um, this guy was brilliant. He was an academician. 
I don't know the subject of his academic um, studies, but he was a PhD or a PhD candidate, and he decided he was going to help the Ukrainian people. So he he joined um, you know an organization that was helping them, and he consults. He said um, with the Ukrainian government, um, very classy, very classy, and it's one after the other like that. I mean, we are finding the smartest, most reasonable, thoughtful, careful, tactical people. And it was not just, he was just not just waving a flag. He was telling, he was answering our questions in, in the most thoughtful way. And I said to myself, gee, you get a whole sample of these Ukrainians um, looking into the future, trying to figure out where they are, what they need to do, uh, comparing their own abilities against the Russian abilities comparing their own governmental solidarity with the Russian lack of solidarity. And you say that in the end, Ukraine really has some talent and they have some integrity, uh, even as regards, um, you know, the battlefield, the madness of battlefield operations. So <clears throat> when I, I, I come to this, uh, you, you have to judge, you have to judge the future on how strong these people are. They are very strong. And uh, assuming for a moment, and I'll go along with, uh, for this discussion with Chuck's optimism that the United States will continue to support them, and um, we can discuss that more tomorrow. Um, but assuming the United States keeps supporting them at the same level, nothing fancy, no, no fighter jets, just, just these good missiles. Um, <clears throat> I think that in the end, um, the people in Russia will not support him. They will leave the country. Uh, they will take the risk of going to jail. There are hundreds of thousands or even over a million people in jail now that he's arrested. Uh, he's breaking his own political back. He's a pariah, not only in the, in the global sense, but in, the, in his own country. Um, this this is um, not a good thing for him. And I think that he's not going to use nuclear weapons. That's just me, me and John F. Kennedy, the two of us. Um, and somebody comes out of the wings now and says, Jay, whatever you are, you're no JFK. <laughs> but I happen to agree with JFK. <laughs> so so um, I think the Ukrainians really are going to have the edge because it's, it's a moral, ultimately a moral question. And ultimately, it's a question of uh, whether autocrats can prevail. And if we find in the world today that autocrats can prevail, if that's where the world's going, well, the Ukrainians have a hard time. But assuming that they're either stable, if, you know, not being, not moving further to the right in any great de degree, um, I think the Ukrainians will prevail and they will have their country. All right. I don't know anyone would say that uh, eight months ago, but um, your prediction is a good one and I hope it comes true. Chuck, same question to you. Your predictions of what we may see in the next six months, 12 months in the Ukraine war. Well, clearly Putin has not learned the Vietnam lesson, which is if you take on people to try and displace them from their homeland, they will outlive you, they will outlast you. And if they get sufficient resources, even if it's much less than you have, but enough to be able to hold their ground, they will rely on that ability to outlive and outlast you. They are in for the interminably long haul. Putin cannot afford to be. He's already reaching into unqualified and resistant people in his own country to be able to feed them into that conflict. Those days have to be numbered. I agree with Jay. All right. Thank you for your, your predictions. Uh, we've run out of time. I'd like to thank my special extraordinary guest, <laughs> Chuck Crumpton. And of course, my extra special, extraordinary co-host, Jay Fidel. Won't you join us next week for American Issues Take One? I'm Tim Apicell, your host. And don't forget to tune in tomorrow for American Issues Take Two with Jay Fidel. And until then, much aloha to all of you.
Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.